on the Hudson Rotary Club. We will start today with an invocation by Doug. Okay. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, in these times of continued uncertainty, we look to you for wisdom and courage and the hope for a better tomorrow. For those who have been hit hard physically and financially, we just pray that your sufficient grace would bring healing and recovery. We thank you that technology allows us to continue to meet and discuss ways we can serve the community and be agents for positive change. Uh, pray that you bless our meeting today, help us all to take something from it that would further equip us to do the work as your stewards. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. And if you would please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And as Rotarians, in the things that we think, say, and do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Randy, sir, I will turn the meeting to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Welcome to all our visitors. I don't have a list of who you all are, but it's good to see some of the faces uh, we haven't seen. Again, Jeff, welcome back from New Zealand. <laughs> District Governor, good to see you. John, I was hoping you'd send some fish to us, but uh, I don't think you were up in Alaska, were you? No, oh, you're on mute. That was John Malberg I'm talking about. Anyways, happy dollars. Who's happy? Yes, Joni. We went to, I don't know how many of you know, but there is an Amish uh, greenhouse by Baldwin. And we went there this past weekend and we spent some money. And we have flowers, like, I live in a paradise. This place is great. And it's well lit up and there are birds and flowers everywhere. So that's my happy book. Excellent. Any other happy dollars? Thank you, Joni. Joni, what was the name of it? It's called the Pleasant Valley Nursery. Um, because it's an Amish place, you go north. If you, went, if you were traveling on 94 and you went north on Highway 63 to the other end of town, then there's a little white Baptist church. And right on that corner, you will find just a little sign that's maybe two foot by two foot that says Pleasant Valley Nursery. You take a right and start heading east, maybe three miles or so. Can't miss it because there's a couple of big long buildings there and it's fantastic. And the prices are really, we got a really, you know, those really big bushel baskets of flowers that are probably $35, $40 anywhere else. We're $25 a piece there. Nice. Mm -hmm. Happy bucks. Any other buddy happy? No one? Okay. Brian and Mary. And the dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's pesting us right now. I ordered a recumbent bicycle so I could exercise at home. And it came in the mail, and Brian's putting it together for me. <laughs> Is that a two-day project, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, uh, the shipping had a little issue with it, so we're working with the uh, company to get a couple of replacement parts. So <laughs> it's always something. Brian and Mary, when did you get a new dog? Uh, just when this all started. What was it? Mid? Yeah, mid-March. Uh, mid 17th that we picked her up on the 17th of March. Congratulations, that's awesome. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Mr. Joel Skinner. Thank you, Randy. I'm happy that Ross volunteered for um, president-elect nominee. Yeah, that's a big honor. Otherwise, it was going to be you, Joel. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> Any other happy bucks? Yes, sir. Our guest. Which guest? I'm uh, happy. My Case? wife. My wife is a um, a 
baker and she loves making bread and we have not been able to find yeast anywhere for weeks and my sister uh, is employed at a restaurant in texas and they basically sold off a bunch of their cooking supplies and she is sending up a giant box of yeast for my wife so we're delighted for that interesting must be like campbell's chicken gumbo nobody can find that make sloppy joes <laughs> oh yeah any other happy box? Yes, sir, District Governor. I've got a, I got, I've got uh, five dollars. I'm not sure how you're going to collect it, but uh, uh, we've got your address. A couple, uh, a couple dollars. Uh, just an announcement on our uh, District 5960 Friday feature. Every Friday at 9 a.m. we join on Zoom. Uh, tomorrow we have a, a presentation on COVID-19 and domestic violence. So. Kind of a, a timely topic there. So join us. I'll uh, put the link in the chat room here at some point. And then uh, three dollars uh, for Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers on here. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, sir. All right, Joni, you made note of that for uh, just adding to Paul's uh, invoice, correct? Yeah. <laughs> Send me the PayPal. You got a PayPal account? Being no happy bucks, uh, let's do a dollar wrap. Oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> Any announcements? Mary. Okay, Grace Place is next week. Brian and I are not going to be delivering anything, but Doug, Doug Schubert volunteered to cart it over there. Uh, the problem is the YMCA kitchen is closed. So we're going to order pizza from Pizza Hut and have Doug transport it unless anyone's got any other ideas or they want to cook or something. Um, volunteers, if you're interested. Get in hold of Mary if there is, but thank you, Doug, for volunteering. Yeah. You're welcome. Yep. Any other announcements? Uh, just one quick update, Randy. Um, on the uh, uh, the Jeff Zeiss challenge to us, we we've raised 225 bucks out of the club so far. So uh, just an update on that. And thank you, Jeff, for making the challenge to us. Okay, <clears throat> that's 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 a good start. <laughs> Let's good see how start. far we go. Yeah, great. Yep. Thanks, Jeff. Just, and Jeff, did you? <laughs> yeah, I just I just want to mention regarding the pizza. If there's any way that uh, maybe takeout could be purchased by a local proprietor restaurant, perhaps, I don't know, yeah, Bricks or one of the smaller ones. EJ's, it might be EJ's, Carboni's, Bricks. Any of the local guys, I know they'd really appreciate it. Uh, you know. Where's the Pizza Hut? It was a Hudson Pizza Hut, but we did, the Domino's in New Richmond was way too expensive. We are trying to keep it down because the Y did it for just two dollars each, which is impossible to manage. Uh, but yeah, we'll look into it. Touch base with Mary if you have so many ideas. Isaac, do you have Rotary Minute? I do indeed. Yes. Uh, let me finish. There we go. So, uh, quick update from Rotary International uh, in. Light of the COVID-19 scenario, they have awarded over $4 million in support of 178 disaster response grants that are directly helping local COVID-19 efforts. Uh, so that is just an unprecedented number. Uh, obviously, you know, Rotarians worldwide are, are stepping up locally and internationally. Uh, so I would like to hand it over to District Governor Paul Perez if he has any numbers on the individual uh, level, at the district level rather, uh, outside of the Rotary International numbers. Paul, I'll turn it over to you if you have anything to add. Sure, thank you, Isaac. Uh, we were part, our district was part of that. Uh, districts were allowed to uh, request $25,000 grants to be used in the district's as the districts see fit, uh, but related to COVID-19. This started uh, 
about two years ago, Rotary International started this disaster response uh, fund. And it was because of all the natural disasters we were having and uh, Rotarians want to do something. And so they would reach out and say, how can I give money to support that? So that was created a couple years ago. And so they decided with COVID-19 uh, that this would be a good, uh, good place to put some of those funds. And um, so they released a million dollars that was gone quick and then went up to three. And now, as Isaac said, over four. Uh, so for our district, we, we sent something out and within two weeks, we had 33 clubs in the district uh, request funds uh, between $500 and $2,500. Uh, the club's portion was uh, minimum $100. And uh, certainly that uh, 25,000 went very quickly, uh, but we were able to at least uh, give uh, a certain percentage to each of the 33 clubs that requested it to do good uh, within their communities. And uh, just uh, proud to be a, a Rotarian. And then uh, uh, one other thing we did is we had some district designated funds. These are the monies that we give to foundation, the Rotary Foundation that come back to us after three years. And we had a pot of 16,000. So uh, we asked clubs to uh, put into that pot. And then with that, and it ended up just over 27,000, uh, we're going to uh, split that three ways and help three different organizations that really blanket our, our district very well. And that's uh, um, uh, Second Harvest and uh, Channel One Food Bank, and then YMC of the YMCA of the Greater Twin Cities, which uh, goes into Hudson. So um, we'll we'll split that up, and we're working with um, those three organizations. And our public image uh, district public image team is working, and we'll have some press releases and uh, really a, a good uh, good coverage of, of uh, that partnership and all the the good that we're able to help uh, in our district and in our, our community. So thank you very much. And uh, just so proud to be a Rotarian right now. Thank you. Thanks, District Governor Paul. Um, any other announcements? If not, I'll turn it back to- This is Dave Schaefer. D okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, joining you today. I'm a member of the Woodbury Rotary Club. Oh. And I just want to say thanks to the district uh, for that matching grants for the COVID. Uh, the Woodbury Rotary Club uh, contributed $1,000 to the local Christian covered food shelf. Their demand has gone skyrocketed, gone from like 200 families a week to over 1,000. And so uh, it's just great to be part of a Rotary Club, that, a Rotary organization that does that. Great, thank you. Uh, Brian, do you want to take it over now? Or unless Isaac, you're going to introduce our guest? I think that's an Isaac's court today. Isaac. Isaac, you're muted, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I am now no longer on mute, uh, but I, I did a fantastic intro, John. <laughs> Our guest speaker, John Sermon, is an award-winning professional videographer and media producer. In his 32 years in the media industry, he's shot video projects in all 50 states and over 18 foreign countries for agency, corporate, and broadcast entities, including ABC, CBS, PBS, BBC, A&E, Fox News, Fox Sports, Showtime, History Channel, Discovery Channel, and many more. He has taught media production classes as an adjunct instructor at the Minnesota School of Business, Digital Video and Digital Video School, and the University of Northwestern in St. Paul. So how about interesting projects? John built the sets, he did the lighting, and shot almost 100% of the 1996 Hurrah for President campaign. He also shot the original JJ Jet, the Jet Plane series before it became real-time animation. He has taped dozens of movie, movie stars, sports figures, musical artists, two astronauts, and the Muppets. He is educated with a BA in communication arts from uh, Texas Lutheran University and a Master of Science degree in radio, TV, and film from the University of North Texas. He has also received multiple awards for his videography, including five nationally recognized Tele Awards. Outside of all his accomplishments, he is also skilled in green screen, 
miniatures, jib and crane work, car mounts, and is a licensed private pilot and drone pilot. John also sought, uh, taught a CFR Part 107 drawing class as an adjunct instructor at the University of Northwestern in St. Paul. John is here today to teach us photography in 20 minutes. So without further ado, John Sermon. Thank you very much, Isaac. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Ah, listen to that applause. <laughs> Actually, you're all muted. Uh, okay, this is my first time to share a screen at a, as the real guy doing the um, show here. So I'm hoping I'm not gonna lose anybody. Um, so let's, can everybody see the screen? Okay, great. All right, so uh, this is tips and trip, tricks for telling your vision. Oop, no. Nope. Did we lose audio? Can you hear no, me? John, we can see you. We cannot see your screen. I misunderstood. Oh, okay. Um, so down at the bottom, click on that green yeah, button that okay. says share screen. Yeah, let me escape out of this. Stand by just a moment. I'm back on Zoom. Got to find you guys. Hang on just a second. Okay, I've got, I clicked on share screen. That's one, right? Yep. Yeah, click on share screen and click there on you share. Go. Okay, can you see my screen now? We can. Yep. Okay, Sweet. beautiful. All right. Now, can you see the PowerPoint presentation? Yep. Blow it up full screen and it's, we're good. Awesome. Okay. So these are tips for telling your visual story. And keep in mind that most of these things you can do with iPhones, you can do with just a, a regular DSLR camera. Um, these are all just basically um, general wisdom on how to take better photos. Every business has a story to tell, whether it's for marketing, advertising, or training. Um, the things that we're gonna cover here is lighting tips for stills and video, composition, move, frame your best shot by moving around, group photos and story pictures, which are worth a thousand words. So a lot of people take pictures in fluorescent lighting and fluorescent lighting is the least flattering uh, light for human subjects because there's kind of an element of green in a fluorescent tube that our naked eye doesn't really see because our eyes adjust really easily to whatever light source we're watching, but cameras see it as just a little bit green and that's not uh, complementary to flesh tones. So um, now we can white balance for it and we can, get, there's ways to work around it, but also it's a very, very flat light. So this is the same subject lit with tungsten lighting. And um, you know, note there's a little bit of uh, a rim light here that separates the subject from the dark background. There's some light slashes over here. There's dark areas, there's light areas. The flesh tones are much warmer and it's just a much more appealing light when you can come in with artificial, artificial lighting. And I light, unless I'm doing something like for a reality series, I've shot House Hunter, I've shot Hoarders, uh, you know, shows like that, reality shows where you don't have time to do a lot of lighting. Um, I will almost always light something and I'll always try and control my light sources. Um, and I joke with people that everything I do is a lie because if I walked into this uh, person's office and just took pictures, this is what it would look like. It would not look like this. So, uh, you know, part of my deal is to, to uh, manage my light. So, as I mentioned earlier, commercial fluorescent lighting is the worst and most unflattering light there is. Try and use some kind of lights for indoor photography if you can, either lights on stands if you're doing video work or use a flash. If you're indoors during daylight hours, you can use natural light coming in from windows. Uh, if you're outdoors, uh, try and use a reflector or a flash to fill in shadows. And when I'm working outdoors, I will almost always, 100% of the time, use a flash to fill in eyes, particularly if, if I'm shooting uh, around noon or when the sun is high, because we get what's called raccoon eyes, where the eyes are totally shadowed uh, by the sun. Let's see if I can, where you look like this, and you know the eyes aren't filled in. And we call eyes the window of the soul, so you always want to see that little dink of glare are, you know, little white spots in the eyes, and that's, that basically means people are alive and, and happy. Um, early morning and late afternoon are typically the best times to shoot outdoors because the sun is low, and we call that the golden hour. 
And outdoors, if there's open shade or overcast, lighting is typically very flat and there are typically no shadows. And that's a great, it's an easy time to shoot because you don't have to worry about, are my, is my subject gonna be filled in and is their face gonna be filled in? Will there be shadows? The downside to that is it's typically very unflattering and flat light. So outdoor, like this gentleman, uh, this was at Arlington National Cemetery and this gentleman was totally backlit by the sun. And so we really can't see his face. But if I used a flash, now I can def definitely see his face. And uh, options when you're outdoors, the easiest thing uh, is to just turn your flash on. You can also use a flex fill, which is a, a fabric, uh, round fabric uh, reflector. You can use foam core, which you can buy at Walmart, or you can use shiny board, which is something you get at production houses. Don't be fooled to thinking that, hey, I'm out, outside, there's great light. Uh, this was in a, a rest outdoor restaurant. And look at the top and the bottom difference by just turning on the fill flash. You can see details in the eyes. You can see that little glare, that little glint in the eye. And this was years and years ago when I shot this. And I sh today I would have asked her to take her sunglasses off. Um, because again, when you look at a photo, the first thing uh, someone looks at when they look at a photo is they look at their eyes. Uh, because there's a lot of expression in your eyes. And if you're wearing sunglasses, you really can't see that at all. Uh, it's impossible to shoot a sunset uh, with the subject in it without a fill flash. And again, uh, this is my daughter years and years ago, and I wish now that I would have told her to take her sunglasses off so we could see her cute eyes, but I did not do that. But again, same picture, same, same settings on the camera. The only difference is I'm using a fill flash in the bottom one. When I do outdoor group stuff, um, I will almost always, always, always try and shoot later in the afternoon. This was done during the golden hour. Uh, we have a lot of fair, fair haired young ladies here. Uh, they're blonde hair. See how it just glows from the golden sunlight at the golden hour. And then I use a flash to pop in and fill their faces in. And I've seen so many team sports pictures where everyone looks into the sun and everybody's doing this. If you can see my face, because they're all squinting to see the sun and none of them have natural smiles. Whereas if you use a flash to fill in, nobody's squinting. They've all got really natural smiles and it's just a great picture. And by contrast, I had them all spin around and this was the final slide in the golf banquet um, uh, for seniors uh, slideshow. Everyone's looking into the sunset and I purposely wanted them to be in silhouette because it adds a little bit of drama. Uh, but you can see there's a nice rim. The sun is acting as a very nice rim light to rim the legs, to rim the faces. faces. It's just a really uh, nice shot. And it's all natural lighting, no flash needed. And sometimes um, using the flash can ruin a shot. This was shot in um, Liberia in an operating room uh, for Children's Surgery International. And at that point in time, this was right after the Civil War. They still didn't have electricity, but the hospital had electricity for three hours a day. And so for three hours a day, they could use um, all the lights, but after that they had a generator and it only powered this one light. Uh, so it could, would cover the surgery field. Can you guys some, not if you can see my cursor? Okay, great. All right, so that covered the field that needed to be covered, but this picture really didn't tell a story because what I did is I flashed off at the ceiling and that, that filled the whole room in a very nice soft light. So everything is, is lit. But this is what it really looked like. And this is the, my favorite picture I've ever taken in my 32 years of videography work. Because all the light source, the main light source covers the surgery field. Yeah, everyone's got a little nice rim there. And then the, the available light that's coming in from the sun uh, through the window is giving a rim to these people and to the Dr. Uh, Stevens there. And, and it also kind of helps balance out the light. But look at the difference in the, the hot spot here and the hot spot here. This was a longer exposure because um, you know, I needed the extra light to, to, to properly expose the picture. So it really, really, really burned out this window and also created a hot spot here. But it, it significantly adds to the drama of the picture of an operating room that's working on one light because that's all the generator could, uh, uh, could provide. Now let's talk a little bit about sources of light. Um, the source of light will determine the color of light uh, the color of your light. For example, if we go outside right now, daytime, daylight looks blue. 
and I could do a 20 minute lecture just on light, uh, light sources. Uh, tungsten light is very yellow. It's measured at 3,200 degrees Kelvin. And then fluorescence vary, they, and they vary widely. They average typically around the 4,500 uh, Kelvin range. And as I mentioned earlier, fluorescents are typically a little bit green, and that's why I've got that in green text. Um, if you've ever seen sodium vapor lights, it's very, very cheap light. A lot of uh, main streets light with this. If you've ever been to Trollhagen ski area, it's uh, everything is yellow. If you shoot um, pictures under uh, sodium vapor light, everything will be cast in yellow. If you look at it on a, on a vector scope, which shows the, the six different colors, there's one spike in yellow. There are, there's no elements of red or green or any other uh, colors with sodium vapor. Um, I once did a, a shoot, uh, training shoot for the Apache helicopter pilot and, and maintenance and gunner training. And we'd go to, to um, Fort Eustis, Virginia for five weeks at a time and we literally took apart a whole Apache helicopter. But in the hang hangar we were sent to work in, there was a rim of uh, windows all around the hangar, which let in blue daylight. The overhead lights were all sodium vapor, which was pure yellow. And then I brought tungsten lights, which were 3,200 degrees, to fill in all the shadows. And it was an impossible lighting deal because we had blue, yellow, and then white, because I was color balanced to tungsten. And so I said, is there any way we can shoot at night? And that way we can totally control the lighting. We can cut, we, we've got no daylight coming in. We can kill the, the uh, sodium vapor overheads. And then we can just light with tungsten. And that way we have pure, you know, quote, white light for all of our stuff. So that's what we would do for five weeks at a time. Uh, moving on, so mercury vapor lights are kind of greenish. If you've ever been to uh, um, Wild Mountain, they use mercury, or they used to use mercury vapor there, and they may have switched over now to, to, uh, to LED. But mercury vapor on film or video tends to be a little bit greenish, and then fluorescents tend to be greenish too. And I talked to you just a moment ago about mixing your sources. If you can, try and control your light sources so you only have one type of light, and even if that means shooting at night. And I'm looking at uh, Brian's home and, and Dave's home and Isaac's home, and I see you all have big windows that provide a nice soft light. If I were to come in and shoot that, I would either put a blue gel on my tungsten light so I could match the blue outside, or I would ask you to pull your shades all closed and we would just use tungsten light to control that. So you wanna try and choose your dominant source, unless it's sodium vapor and just avoid that. So most of you, if you've got a nice DSLR camera, and when I say nice, you can get a really good DSLR camera for three to $400 now. They used to be super, super expensive and they've come down dramatically in price, but you can also take great pictures with iPhones. Um, I remember years ago, um, Probably 15 years ago, I was asking a, a wedding photographer when he was going to switch over from film to video or film to digital cameras. And he goes, as soon as they come up with a, a sensor that can do five megapixels, well, five megapixels is what we have on our cell phones. So um, you can take beautiful pictures with the cell phone if your lighting conditions are, pro, uh, are good. So if on the back of your camera, if you go to your white balance deal, you can go in here and you can select you know, what you want to do, whether it's auto white balance, which is perfectly fine to do that. And if you're starting on photography, I would totally encourage you to let the camera pick the white balance. Uh, then this is sunlight, which is about 5,600 degrees. This is uh, op uh, shade. And then this is open shade, which shades are probably around 6,000 degrees. This is around 9,000 to 10,000 degrees Kelvin. Very, very blue light. And, uh, and then uh, tungsten light is 3,200 degrees. And then you have fluorescent, which is in the 4,500 range. Flash, then you can bracket, and then you can dial in your own Kelvin number. This is on a, a, a Canon 6D, which is kind of an expensive uh, professional camera. But I have seen most of these settings on most uh, lesser expensive cameras. So let's talk about quality of light. Soft light, this is what soft light looks like. Soft light totally wraps around the subject and is a very, very sexy light. If uh, I used to shoot uh, Mary Kay, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mary Kay Cosmetics up here. Uh, Mary Kay Ash, uh, when she was elderly, she had wrinkles and she hated wrinkles. And so we would build a 12 foot by 12 foot white silk and put 40,000 watts worth of light through that to make a very bright, very wide source that would totally wrap around all of her wrinkles 
and it uh, you know kept her from looking like she had any wrinkles at all because she that was very important to her. Both of these things were shot outdoors. Uh, the top picture was shot just inside of a tent, so I was allowing the light to come in from the the uh, open shade. And the same thing with the bottom. This was open shade, uh, no sun or no um, direct sunlight, and you can see that they're just very nice deals. Sometimes we want specular light. We want hard light. We want to see detail. We want to see lines. This was for an opening for an ESPN uh, show called Outside the Lines. And um, we wanted to, to show all the detail of the athletes, their muscles, the ripples, the, the contours of their bodies. So we purposely had very, very specular light. If, again, if you had an elderly person and you wanted to say this is a 100-year-old person and you wanted to accentuate their wrinkles, you would use hard light on that and it would accentuate every single wrinkle. Now we're gonna talk about framing and composition. This picture, I don't remember if my son or daughter took this, but they were probably about six years old. And this is my poster child photo for the worst picture ever. And, but, but they get a pass because they were young and, and it's like, daddy, can I take a picture? And I just couldn't say no, whoops. So the problems with this, this photo, one, I've got a tree growing out of my head. Two, I'm not lit by any kind of flash. I mean, I'm totally in silhouette. You can't see any detail in my eyes. Third, if you look at the midline, I'm not quite centered up and I'm not quite asymmetrical. Whoa. It's kind of an awkward, awkward, you know, deal. Next, there's an, an immense amount of headroom. Uh, you don't want to have this much headroom in a picture. My head is almost in the center of the frame, and that's very much a, an amateur uh, mistake. So for all these reasons, uh, this is a poor, a poor um, photo. What you want to do is you want to try and fill your frames. And one of the tools we, we use is called the rule of thirds, where you break your picture into nine squares. And some of you may even have um, a grid that you can turn on on the back of your camera to remind you to use the rule of thirds. But what you want is you want the most important things in the picture to fall on those intersections. And if you do that, you will guarantee that you will always fill your frame with something visually interesting. Here's another picture. Those hands and faces are in the, the deal. Um, and more about filling your frame, um, I, was, I got to do a Toby Keith USO tour and this was in Germany and, and my boss said, hey, would you take my picture? And I said, yeah. And I took his picture and I said, would you take my picture? Because that castle in the background was a, had some historical significance. This is on the Rhine River. So I, so, and I knew that, that I was gonna end up with a picture like this because I knew one day I'd wanna teach with it. So again, my head's kind of centered up and we do see the castle, but um, you know, from a framing standpoint, it's not really great. This is the picture I took with him. I set him off to the side, I compressed a shot with a zoom lens, and now the picture, the castle is dramatically larger than it is in my picture. And you know, that's one of the important features. We still see the Rhine River and we still see him. And if you look, you can just kind of see the little glint in his eye, which is from when I, I fired my flash. So all it was was just changing lenses. And again, with an iPhone, with the new iPhones, you can use a zoom lens, but uh, I wanted to compress the picture to make the background larger. And then I moved him off to the side. So we're gonna talk a little bit about balance. Symmetrical balance is where both sides of the frame are, are totally equally weighted and it's considered typically boring. Asymmetrical balance is when each side is a little bit different and it's typically more interesting. For example, the last photo was asymmetrical balance. So here we have, the Washington Monument, and this is, is, is totally balanced equally, both vertically and horizontally. And because of that, you can, the eye can scan that picture in two seconds and you've already seen it. There's nothing visually interesting about that. You see a lot of group pictures the same way. Uh, this half of the picture is, is weighted visually the same as this half of the picture. So what do we do? Walk, remember that your feet move walk, find something to frame that in that you can give it something else a little bit more visually interesting. And also I typically try and stay away from vertical photographs unless I'm actually, you know, there's a reason I need to be in, in a, a vertical format because I do a lot of presentations and a television monitor or a video screen or a movie screen is in a horizontal format. So I'll try and find something that I can frame my picture in to allow me to have a horizontal format and to make the, the symmetrical balance look a little bit more asymmetrical, a little more visually interesting. Um, this is uh, called converging lines, where lines go off into the distance. 
What would have really made this cool is if I had someone standing here in this doorway. This was right after the Civil War in uh, Liberia, and this was a trashed out hospital. Railroad makes really great converging lines, um, but I do, I, I put this in here for uh, a very simple warning. It is illegal for you to take pictures on a railroad track. You are trespassing. Railroads typically own 75 feet from the center line of the rails to the sides of the rails. And so if you're on that 75 feet right away, you are trespassing on railway property. If a train engineer or conductor see you, they will immediately call resource protection and they will have you arrested for trespassing. Uh, they take it very, very, very seriously. Yet photographers still wanna go do the converging lines on railroads. Now I contract um, a whole bunch for BNSF Railway. So when I took this, I was wearing the appropriate uh, PPE or personal protective equipment. And we also had track and time, meaning that the, um, the controller in a bunker in Fort Worth shut down this portion of the rails so I could do some video work on this bridge. Um, which is about to be replaced in, in Bismarck, North Dakota. So anyway, long story short, please do not do photography on rails. I know it's tempting and I know it's really cool, but uh, it will get you in trouble. And your photograph is basically proof of your trespass. So that's the other deal. Um, I've got an interesting situation where um, I was a judge in a, in a school uh, um, film festival and one of the things, one of the, the documentaries took place all on the rails or next to the rails. And I, you know, pointed this out to the, the, the festival judge and, and the uh, department chair and said, you know, this whole thing is nothing but trespassing. If any of my clients at BNSF saw this, there would be a phone call to that individual and he would be put under, under arrest for trespassing and his film would be proof of his trespass. So again, please don't do this. Here we are again, asymmetrical balance. Notice how important things fall on the corners. Again, this is a very, very great tool to help you fill your frames. Sometimes we wanna leave a hole in a picture when we have asymmetrical balance, and that we call that a donut. And the reason for a donut is that's where we put a title. Uh, when I shoot commercials, sometimes they say, hey, leave a donut for me in the bottom left corner. That donut's for a price point. One more asymmetrical balance. I found this really cool tree and this was an interesting way to frame up the rest of this bridge in North Dakota. Another asymmetrical balance. This is the eye candy. This is what's really cool. But when you look at it in relationship of the mountains in the background, you realize that this is perched in a really high interesting area. When you do people, same thing. You can have a story back here. They're here that puts them in relationship or juxtaposition to that travel area. And then also note the, the little glint in their eyes. This was from my fill flash. Notice the sunlight rim on the back of their heads. Had I not done this, their faces would both be totally silhouetted and uh, indistinguishable. More asymmetrical balance. This is another uh, interesting shot from Liberia. This was an OR2. After the, the uh, power went out, they didn't have enough generator power to power both um, operating theater lights. So I thought, well, what's a good way to, to tell the story that I was filming in the dark? And all the light from this is coming from the surgical field is coming from my sun gun right there. And then, well, how do we tell that story? Well, I moved until this, the window was silhouetting my camera because everything in the room was dark, you know, outside the surgical field. And that way you can clearly see the definition of my camera and you can see the surgical field, asymmetrical balance, and it all tells the story. We're gonna talk now about look space or lead space. Whenever you use a camera or a gun or someone pointing or gesturing, you always wanna give them what we call look space or lead space. Doesn't matter what it is, leave this side of the frame just a little bit empty and that will make your, uh, pic your pictures a little bit more interesting. I see this all the time. People say, you know, they're at a monument or they're at some, some kind of, deal and they say, hey, go stand next to the whatever. Well, then you can't really see who the people are. Now, if you're doing this to show this is a battleship Texas with its 14 inch guns, if you're trying to do that to show scale, well, this is a good way to show scale. But I always say, just move, walk forward. I'll keep walking until I tell you to stop. Now we have the same photo, 
but we can actually see who their subjects are in the photo. Same thing at monuments. Hey, go stand next to the photo. Well, that's great if you want to show the, the size of it. But if you do that, please look at the headroom also for the monument and don't leave a ton of sky up here because then these, these characters are going to be even much smaller and they're just going to be two little dots. So a better deal is, you know, show the family. Here I've turned such that people aren't looking directly into the sun. You can see the sun rimmed on this side of the faces. My wife didn't take her glasses off for me. But anyway, now no one's squinting into the sun like they were in the last picture. Um, when my son was in scouts, we had scout day at the Minnesota Capitol. And this was the same picture that everybody took. Hey, stand there on the sidewalk and I'm gonna take your picture with the Capitol. What do we have here? Symmetrical balance, top and bottom are weighted the same as the left and right sides. It's very visually uninteresting. And you really can't see much about my son being a scout. Moving forward, walk forward. Why not walk him even closer? There's no reason not to. We still know he's at the same capital of Minnesota, but now I can actually see all his badges and see all the stuff that he's accomplished as a scout. Um, and as a side note, he did make Eagle Scout and I'm very proud of him. But um, I did have a flash, yeah, thanks Isaac. I did use a flash to try and feel in his eyes. This was from an iPhone. So again, you can do this on an iPhone. Just tell your subject to move closer. But even at midday, with an iPhone, it just does not have enough juice to, to fill in shadows on an eye. The sun is just incredibly bright. I always tell people don't take um, verticals with your cell phone unless you really, really need to do that. Uh, this was the same picture that everybody was taking. This was at the um, a sports coliseum in, I believe in Athens, Greece. And everybody was taking this picture, so I mimicked, mimicked so I could just show you, this is what the standard picture was. Um, we, were, we really want to see that we're at a, the Coliseum, so why not turn your phone sideways? If you're going to stand at the same place and have her 20 feet away, at least show us what we're supposed to see here with you know, a lot less headroom. And why not bring her in? I've got the same framing for the whole background, but now I can actually see that that's my wife. So again, move your subjects so you can see who they are. It's a very simple deal. It doesn't cost any extra. It, it just will add so much to your photography if you're trying to tell a story with people in it. Don't take vertical selfies. Again, turn your camera sideways so at least you can see a little bit of where you are when you're taking your selfie. Now there are exceptions to this rule. This was a shot I took. These are four anesthesiologists at a mission hospital in Demo, India. And I thought, well, this is a story we don't want to tell because we want to see their faces. You can see the little glint in each one of their eyes because I use the flash. There's Mission Hospital in the background. This is the perfect picture, right? No, they all exclaim, this is not what we want. We want to show that we're wearing our saris. So, okay, in this situation, we're going to take a vertical shot. And this was a shot that when I walked up on this scene and saw what was happening, I said, hey, I, I, can, I can use this as a teaching moment. So let me do, let me replicate your shot. So I replicate what they were taking. And I said, there's one thing we can do a little bit better. Let's shoot from a lower angle. Now we've got Mission Hospital. Now our picture tells a story. I've got this, you can see the same saris head to toe, but where are we? Well, just squat down a little bit. There's Mission Hospital. That tells exactly where we are, tells the entire story. So again, nothing magic here. We're taking the same camera, same location, same everything. We've just moved around just a little bit to complete the story. Another form uh, exception to horizontal formats. This was at a monastery in Greece and it's way up on the hill. And this is kind of a nice shot that shows it's way up on the hill. But if we go sideways, then we can see how high up on the hill it actually, or hill, the whatever you call that geographic, geological formation, it's at the very top. So this kind of accentuates the story, but we're in the horizontal format. More on composition and choosing angles. Uh, this was a family vacation years and years ago. Uh, we decided we're going to take our picture in the sand. We wrote Merry Christmas. It's a great picture. But we can improve it to give us some context by dropping the camera all the way down and showing our cruise ship in the background. Now, if I had this talent back then, I would have taken these people out but um, with Photoshop, but I never did bother to do that, and I probably should have done it for you guys, but uh, that's my mistake, so learn from it. But anyway, again, nothing magic about this. Just change the camera angle, and you can tell a more complete story. This was the picture when my, my daughter was 
inducted in the National Honor Society. This, I stood in the same place that everyone else took their pictures with, uh, with their iPhones. And this is the picture we get. Now, what's the most important thing in the picture? It's my daughter in her uh, award. So why would you stand this far back? This is the same picture everybody took with um, when everybody was in it. But think about your background. See, remember this got milk gal? She's creeping in the back of this photo now. So think about your backgrounds. Um, and then also, why do you need to be so far back? Why not move in close? We still know they went to St. Croix Falls High School. I slid over. Now Brendan's got a little bit more hair from the milk lady. But now we can actually see their faces in great detail. We can see their smiles and the flash fills in their eyes. So this is a much better picture than the way back picture. And all you got to do is take six steps forward. There's nothing magical about this. Just think about the perimeter of your shot. What's the story we're trying to tell? Um, this was my parents and my Aunt Joy. Um, last year, we went and had uh, dinner together or lunch together. This was a noonday shot. We came out from the dark restaurant, and my parents' glasses are starting to change. But this really doesn't tell us any story, and it's uncomfortable for them because they're really squinting. Here, they're not squinting anymore. I just moved them five feet over into the shade, but it still doesn't really tell a story. So why not squat down a little bit? And now you can tell we all just had lunch at the Mexican Inn restaurant. And uh, I should have waited a little bit longer for their glasses to turn but uh, clear, but I was trying to get out of there. But now nobody's squinting. We see natural smiles, and we know where we were, all just by moving a couple of feet and then squatting down. Context. This is at a museum where, if you read the, the placards, this uh, bronze statue was actually part of this larger deal. But to put it in a better context, why not just move over here where you can see this guy and it's the same guy as this. Okay, I get it now. But just squat, if you'll squat a little bit lower, you can now see him head to toe. And again, this picture tells a little bit better story than this picture, plus there's a lot less white space. So I can make the subject matter almost fill the, the frame top to bottom. Again, same lens, same camera, same exposure. I just moved. How simple is that? Think about things. Group photos, we're gonna spend a little time with group photos here. Um, I've had lots of opportunities to take group photos and one of my favorite things or least favorite things is the, the uh, what I call the firing squad. Everybody against the wall, we're gonna take your picture, tall people in back, short people in the, the front. You've, you've all heard that, right? So this is what I call the firing squad. What I prefer to do, and this is a fine picture, but what I prefer to do is find something to stand on, shoot down on them, Tell them to go squeeze up, you know, like your best friends. Everyone squeeze together, squeeze together. And now look how much larger their faces are than they were at the firing squad. You know, the faces are probably almost twice as large, so it's a lot easier to see. And most times in social situations, when people get this close, it might be un an uncomfortable smile, but most everybody is usually smiling better than they were when they were in the firing squad. So I love doing this. Now, I was standing on a chair when I did this. I am not uh, asking you to stand on a chair if that's gonna be dangerous for you. If you do feel like you need to do that, have someone hold on to you while you do it because you're gonna be looking through the viewfinder and, and it's easy to lose your balance. Uh, most times I'm on top of a, some form of platform or up a staircase or something, but please, please do be safe. I don't want anyone to have an accident because of my coaching. Uh, this is in uh, Demo, India. This is a nice picture that shows context. We're at the Central India Christian Mission Place. But again, we really don't care what kind of shoes they were wearing. Um, what we're really more interested in is their faces. And look, a face here, Melissa's about, her face is twice as big as a cursor. And over here, where's Melissa? There she is in front. Now her face is like four times bigger than the cursor. What I did here is I climbed up on top of a, the bus that we were using because it had one of those staircases or you know ladders that you can climb on the top of the bus. I noted that we had a beautiful morning sunlight coming up and notice the golden sunlight and all the hair here. Everybody's rimmed with the golden sunlight. And then I pop my flash to fill in the, the little dink in their eyes. And we have a great picture. Everyone's got natural smiles and we can see their faces clearly. All right. So now the downside of this is we lose a little context because we don't have the location, the CICM you know, framing behind them. But if you wanna see who was on the team, 
these are your team members, folks. Same thing, this was at a, a, a dinner at, uh, in Luxembourg on a World War II tour. You see everybody clearly here, we can see what their shoes look like and, and what their, their outfits were. But what we're really interested in is smiling faces. So again, I stood on a little platform just five feet from where I took that first picture, and now we can see their faces. Uh, this was the MAO meeting two or three years ago. Can anyone guess who the president was at that time, or the new president is? Well, they're all doing the firing squad, tall people in back, short people in the front. But if I stood on that platform now, guess who the president is? Ding, 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 ding. He's standing in the middle. So another great way to see faces clearly and to uh, get big smiles and fill your frame. Now I will add a warning. If, um, you, if there are females in the group that are wearing low cut dresses, uh, this is probably not a good idea because we don't, we wanna keep everything uh, appropriate. So be wary of that. Uh, but otherwise, if you shoot up from just a little bit, and I was raised probably about 18 or 20 inches on a platform, this is a good way to do that. Here's a group photo where I did not want, I kept trying to get everybody to scoot closer together and I was gonna shoot from where everybody's sitting and there's a, a drop off behind them and, and get everybody closer. But they said, no, 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 we want it wide, we want it wide. Well, the reason they wanted it wide is they wanted to put on a coffee mug and it had to wrap all the way around. So sometimes there's gonna be exceptions to that. We're gonna talk a little bit about digital Zoom. Um, many of you have digital Zooms on your iPads and iPhones. Please, please avoid using your digital Zoom. Use your, um, your, your uh, mechanical Zoom, which is basically your feet, and just walk up to the thing that you wanna take a picture of. This is um, one of our cats, eight feet. This is the cat with the digital Zoom. Now to see detail, this is the detail of that. This looks like a paint by number picture. Remember paint by number? I think you're all enough, old enough to remember that. Look how blotchy the tan areas are and the brown areas are. That's because you've, you've expanded all the pixels, you've lost all the detail in the whiskers, you've lost the detail in the eye, and that's because you've used a digital zoom. This is the same picture taken from two feet away. Now look at the detail in the fur, look at the detail in the whiskers, look at the detail in the eye. Um, same camera, same aperture, same everything, I just moved in to about two feet away and I didn't use that digital zoom. So try and avoid that. We're gonna talk a little bit about story pictures. Um, look, whenever you're, you wanna tell a story, look at all the elements in your background to tell your story. To get this picture, I was about 70 feet away using a zoom lens laying on my belly on the sidewalk. These are some of the preeminent surgeons from uh, Minnesota and at the Phoebe Hospital, we were the first medical team back in there after the Civil War. There's a Liberian flag. There's this thing that says Phoebe Hospital. This was a, a nurse from Liberia who fled before the Civil War. This is our first trip back. So anyway, we've got all the players, we've got the setting, we've got the Liberian flag, but I had to do a couple things to make this all work, which is get way back, get on my belly, wait till they weren't looking at me and curious as to what I was doing on my belly, and then I snapped the picture. I really don't care so much for when you're trying to tell a story, everybody you know, looking at the camera. This was DFW Airport, um, early in the morning, 5 a.m. You never see it this empty. Crystal K, that tells a story. Uh, photojournalists, whenever a photojournalist is telling a story with pictures, they typically do wide picture, medium picture, close-up picture. Wide, medium, close-up. Here's a story. My wife and I were given uh, tickets to a, a Green Bay Packers game, and you can see me clearly holding the pickets, tickets there. I saw this as an opportunity to teach you guys something on framing your shot. I gave some, I was taking our, our, a selfie of us and um, a guy walks up and says, hey, do you want me to take your picture? I said, yeah, I would love that. Just, I just wanna make sure that you can tell that we're at Lambeau Field. Okay, no problem. So he walks about 30 feet away, takes his picture. I said, perfect. Now I want you to take a second picture, but I want you to get closer to me. Closer, 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 closer. He kept like, Ooh. I said, now turn the, the camera vertical. Now you can see we're at Lambeau Field. You can see our big smiles and you can see that we're the Vikings Packer game. None of the things you could see way back. Again, I'm using the same camera. It's just, uh, I had the, the photographer move and you get, you get a great story picture. So it's generally unacceptable to use out of focus photos unless 
it's Bigfoot. You can sell those pictures. You can always sell a Bigfoot picture. Loch Ness Monster or a UFO. These are all things that are acceptable to show somebody if it's out of focus. And finally, uh, drone rules. I'm just going to real briefly talk about drone rules. The FAA defines commercial use of uh, as anything that contributes to the furtherance of a business. And so it doesn't matter if you're working for a nonprofit or a for-profit company. If you're furthering that business with your drone videography or drone photos for marketing or advertising or anything, even on Facebook or whatever, you need to have a Part 107 license. So that includes real estate, farming, civic events, roof inspections. If you're a roofer and you want to buy a drone to inspect your roofs and you're not selling the pictures, you're not showing the pictures to anyone, you're just doing it for your own use because you don't want to have to climb a ladder, you're furthering your business with that tool. So you have to be licensed under Part 107. And again, it doesn't matter if you work for free or for charity. Some other quick drone notes, you cannot ever fly over people. Uh, you have to have a special license um, that takes 90 days to get, and it's typically for Hollywood type projects. You cannot fly from a state park or a national park. Now, can you fly over a park? Yes, the national parks don't own the airspace over them. You can overfly them, but do not land there because you will be breaking federal law. Do not take off from there or you'll be taking breaking federal law, but you can certainly overfly it. Now, they used to not allow that, but now they've, they've lightened their uh, rules on that. Um, I once had our, I did some work, some drone work for our school district and the, and the principal told me, he said, just so you know, uh, we don't out allow anyone to overfly our school. It's a no drone school. And I said, well, the Federal Avi Aviation Administration controls all airspace. Once you get an inch above the ground, the FAA controls all airspace and you don't have the authority to keep me from flying over the school. Now you can tell me, you know, you don't want me to, or it wouldn't be appropriate for me to, and I can, I can accept that, and I can't take off from the school ground or land on the school ground, but I, you know, I, I, you know, I have the, the rights to overfly it as long as it's uh, Class G airspace. Um, now, is it appropriate? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, so don't fly in places where it's inappropriate, even if you have the ability to do that. Um, you can't fly beyond line of sight. You can't fly at dusk or night without navigation lights. You can't fly a drone within eight hours of consuming alcohol. This was kind of interesting. I took my drone with us on a, a cruise on a catamaran with my brother-in-law and another couple and my wife and I, and I wanted to do a bunch of drone work. Well, there was a lot of alcohol on the boat. And so I always had to plan my drone shots as for first thing in the morning before my brother-in-law made us Bloody Marys. Uh, because otherwise, if I had a Bloody Mary at 8 a.m., I can't fly for another eight hours. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, you cannot fly for a nonprofit or even for free without a Part 107 license. Now you can fly under the model aircraft rules if you wanna fly just for the joy of flying. But when I taught the drone class at University of Northwestern St. Paul, we bought true drones and I could not, you can't even train to fly for, for video work uh, without either being a licensed pilot or without having a, a licensed drone pilot within arm's reach of you. Um, that's the FAA rules. So if you just want to buy a drone and practice because one day I'm going to get my license, you can't even practice without a licensed pilot or a licensed drone pilot right next to you within arm's reach. Um, so they're really persnickety on this. There have been a number of drone accidents. They, we have yet to see a, a medevac helicopter be brought down with the drone, but if that ever happens, you can expect uh, draconian measures to cut out on a lot of the illegal flying because I can go to, to Facebook and see all kinds of illegal drone stuff. The FAA is just overwhelmed, so they can't take care of it all, but they're, they're working on it. And that's my uh, story. Um, I'm happy to take uh, questions. My website's at the bottom, my phone number's at the bottom. Um, if you've got questions and wanna call on the phone, uh, that's fine. If you wanna email me, um, I didn't put my email on there, but it's very simple. It's my name, John Sermon, with no spaces, uh, at gmail.com. Um, and I don't know how we're looking now, Randy, with the time. If you guys want to do questions, I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Anyone have any questions for John? Yes. I do, I do, I do. Okay. <laughs> um, if you take a bad shot, but it's all you've got, 
can you get a reflection out of an eyeglass or out of an eye? Um, I edit it somehow. Yeah, you, well, you can go into Photoshop and you can literally paint it. If you've got, if you, if you have a second shot of it, you can literally go in and paint it and, and fix it through Photoshop. But you really need to be a skilled Photoshop artist to do that. And, you know, some shots are one in a million that, that, you know, that was the only, you know, that you were, you saw a celebrity and you pulled out your camera and just as that, before they turned away from you, you, you snapped it and it's a little bit out of focus. Keep those. <laughs> I mean, I, and I've got a bunch of those and I tell you, you know, you don't want to keep it out of focus unless it's Bigfoot or Elvis or something like that. But there are some pictures uh, and particularly of family members or grandparents, some of those pictures are out of focus and, but that's all you got. So, so keep those. Um, some of the, the photo processing um, programs today can, can help take and, and sharpen photos just a little bit if they're just slightly out of focus, but like glare and stuff in glasses, that's kind of hard to fix unless you go in and do it on Photoshop. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard to do. Now you can also go in, you can add that little dink of light in their eyes. That's an easier thing to do on Photoshop. Put a little white speck in their eye like the glare. Um, so that's something that can more easily be done. Thanks. Yes, Isaac. So with the proliferation of digital cameras, and I'm not even talking about smartphones yet, right. but with digital cameras that came out 10, 15, 20 years ago, have you seen more uh, amateur and then eventually professional photographers come out of the uh, the technology being easier to access and, you know, easier to recycle media without having to uh, develop film in a, a dark room or wait for a, a photo processing center. It, has photography become more common uh, in that regard? Yes, it has. Everyone today, everyone's a cameraman. Um, and just real briefly, my story, I went to school for radio, television, film. I've got a master's degree, as you saw earlier. Uh, I did an internship at the Zale Corporation and at a production house. I got a first, my first corporate job uh, for Flight Safety International. Then I worked for a, a production house where I did all kinds of crazy stuff, including the Ross Pro stuff. And then once I had built my reel, after about seven years of doing this, I had enough clients confident in my skills that I could go to the bank and say, I need a $90,000 loan to buy a Betacam SP package, which includes the camera, the tripod, the lens batteries and a monitor. And it's like, whoa, $90,000. So I was able to show him how I cash flowed money renting equipment. And he goes, okay, yeah, I'll take a risk on it. And he did. Well, then my first HD package in 2001 cost $150,000 to finance. That was a camera and that was a monitor, an HD monitor, and that was an HD record deck. So if you want to get in HD photography back in 2001, the price tag for getting in was 150 grand. My last HD camera I bought in 2010, you uh, fast forward nine years, uh, and, and just the body of that camera was $60,000. My next camera was uh, $26,000, and that camera had the Cine Alte chipset, the same chipset that Star Wars Episode Three was shot on. So anything I shot with that camera, I could put on the big screen at the movie theater and it looked beautiful. Um, that was 10 years ago. Today, I can buy a camera, a professional video camera that has either, you can choose to shoot in 4K or 6K. So it has either two or three times the resolution of my last camera for $2,800. So what has happened is every Tom, Dick and Harry who wants to be a videographer, takes their credit card out and they go buy these nice cameras, no film school, no in internship, no education, no background. And now I'm going to head to head with all these guys, uh, including the ones that are shooting on iPads, the ones that shoot on iPhones, the ones that shoot on cheap DSLRs. Cheap DSLRs make beautiful pictures. My uh, um, last project I shot, I shot on my Canon D6. A Canon D6, when I first bought it was uh, $2,000. It got stolen when I was at Rockfest doing a Rockfest show and uh, someone stole it out of our room and I bought a replacement for it. It was $800. I don't know what it would cost today, but it's, I'm sure it's cheaper than $800. And it makes a beautiful full raster HD picture. So anybody can get into the game today and everybody is getting into the game today. So that's, it's actually decimated 
people like me because this is what we do for a living and the day rates had dramatically decreased and the quality of what people accept for professional video has has dramatically decreased because all day long people watch videos on YouTube and on Facebook and Instagram and blah 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 that were shot with cell phones bad lighting bad composition bad audio so they've come to a, a, adjust to that and accept that as the new norm so when I tell people what my day rate is which is has been significantly de decreased uh, over the last two years they're going well I can get this guy to do it for a hundred bucks <laughs> it's like well, if that's what you want, go do it. But I can't tune my services down to that rate. And I can't work. You know, I'm not going to do it without lights. And I'm not going to do it without microphones and blah, 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 like he is. Um, I just can't do that. So it's, it's really destroyed. I mean, there's a new paradigm for what is professional media. And I remember back 10 years ago or 15 years ago when America's Funniest Home Videos came out, we saw all these uh, home video you know, film on camera from VHS that was grainy, the color saturation was bad, but people loved it because it was the content they wanted. It wasn't the subject. Right after that, South, I remember Southwestern Bell was the first one to shoot what we call shaky cam, where the frame is kind of drifting the whole time. Well, we all emulated shaky cam because that was the new thing. Then I remember when um, uh, there was a music video, and I think it was by the Foo Fighters came out, and it was an amateur guy that shot the film. This was back in the old days with film. He left it in his trunk. And when he took it to the lab to have the film developed, and this was 16 millimeter film, the, the film had been baked in his trunk. And so when they got into the lab, chunks of silver uh, nitrate um, came off the film. So there were huge chunks empty in the film where it would just showed through clear. Well, that was all the film they had. So, they, and they couldn't redo it. So they put the video out like that. And that became the new cutting edge style. An American cinematographer, a magazine that was all about cinematic um, excellence, had a deal, an article on how to bake your film in the oven to replicate this thing. So we, we see trends and now the trend is for more and more amateur work. I mean, it can be a beautiful camera, but you know, the storytelling is terrible and uh, <laughs> It's just, it's just made, made it very hard for people like me, the old guys. And I'm, I'm too young to <laughs> retire, but, um, and I love doing what I do. It's just become very, very difficult. Hey, hey John, um, really great um, talk. I got one, uh, one quick question. Um, I don't have any tungsten lights, but I got a lot of LED lights around the house. How, well, what's your feeling about the, the lighting from LED lights? Oh, LED lights are great. That's what I'm using right now. Okay. <laughs> um, the... And these have been a game changer too, because uh, in the old days, um, you know, I had to pack up trunks of, or not trunks, but a trunk with heavy tungsten lights that drew a thousand watts or 650 watts. And I had to, to string all my extension cords way, way out to make sure I wasn't gonna blow a circuit breaker somewhere. And um, LEDs, you can run them on batteries. Now I happen to have this one on plugged into the wall, but their current, current draw is, hardly anything. And then the other neat thing is this one, I can dial in the color temperature from full tungsten to full daylight and anywhere in between. So it, it adds a lot of flexibility. It makes it a lot easier to do. Um, makes, I can travel much lighter. Um, the downside to LEDs is they're very expensive, especially when you get into the cinematic ones um, because you want big light sources and the, the bigger, you know, thousand watt light sources, they'll start around $1,200. So that's kept some of the amateurs out, but the, the cheaper ones like this, I think I paid like one one fifty for this one. So, but their LEDs are awesome. Okay, thanks. I got a comment. Yes, sir. Um, regarding the quality of uh, so-called professional photography, uh, I've noticed that uh, the broadcast, uh, TV broadcasts are, uh, a lot of people are uh, broadcasting from home. People like uh, Jimmy, Kimmel and, and whatever, right, right. and the quality is really nowhere near what it would be in a, in a studio. And so I'm thinking that uh, um, what we're seeing on Zoom right now uh, may become the new quality uh, acceptance level. <laughs> that, that's so it's exactly going to get... It's going to get worse. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Charles. I mean, I look at everybody in the in the 
the screen here and you know I see you know okay let me throw this out I've been in a lot of zoom meetings lately um, particularly with rotary actually and if you're gonna do a zoom meeting please 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 do not have a bright window or a bright light right above your head because the the iris in the your your webcam is going to see that and it's going to go oh well, it's too bright let's make it dimmer and you're going to your face is going to be in silhouette much like this now see when i did that you can see my face but did you see how the, the background totally got blown out so whereas when i put a light you know the lighting is all a little bit more even um so think about where you're going to position yourself and charles you're actually in probably one of the best situations because your headroom is perfect you're perfectly centered up and you've got a nice background and there's nothing glaring uh you know no lights glaring into the the frame that's going to change your your aperture it's a green screen actually oh is it okay yeah <laughs> all right well that's perfect so um you know think about that when you're doing you know be friendly to your other uh zoom people because uh you can you can do just a, a few small things to to really improve your uh your lighting i've got a desk lamp here that i can turn on probably should have done that um but see how that totally fills me in yeah. and it's it's got a 40 watt bulb in it and it's a very simple way just to fill me in so I'm, you know my skin color tones are good you can see my rosacea real nice um and um you know we're not really so much interested in my background as we are what my face looks like so this this really helps a bunch but windows in the background um will really degrade your picture because the it confuses the iris and goes whoa 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 that's blasting me out and it's uh i don't know if i can strip I mean, here i can do this so if this is a window see how much darker my face got because it's trying to it's trying to iris up enough so you can see my detail but it sees that there's a really really bright source behind me so um that's something to consider but i i totally Totally agree with you, Charles. I like your new background. Um, it's uh, after seeing all these Zoom Zoom uh, meetings, it's going to really lower the bar in terms of what people accept for uh, quality video. It's going to make it harder. And all the the newscasters who are shooting from home, and uh, I know some of them have some help from from videographers, and some of them don't. Uh, I guess it depends on what their budgets are. But this is we're we're coming into a whole new world after this uh, coronavirus. Well, John, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Isaac. Today. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah. And uh, unless there's something else, Jeff, uh, thanks for joining from New Zealand. Go enjoy your morning coffee now or go for your morning yeah. walk. Oh, yeah. It's, it's going to yeah. be a great day. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we'll be back same time, same place next week. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>